Well, how you doing today? I'm Pastor Ken, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and welcome. Thank you all for being with us today. Welcome to our online audience that have taken the opportunity to tune in and be with us. We had a great Easter celebration last week. It was fantastic. And this week, you can see we began the next phase of our uh, Community by Design uh, project that's going on. So guys, bear with us through the inconvenience of these times. Our larger bathrooms are being worked on, so the new smaller renovated ones are available, plus... We're trying to do everything in our power to help you through these times. We put some bathrooms outside of the area of our our cafe. All of these are the things we're trying to do, that through these times of inconvenience, we would hope that you would bear with us and give us grace through that time, because it's going to be fantastic when it's all done. Well, we've been in a series we began just before on Palm Sunday. We started a series called Tough as Nails. Because we began to discover that Jesus is the brand. Jesus was as tough as nails, and so can we be. As we looked at last week, the very followers, the first followers of Jesus, and their initial responses, when Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was crucified, they lost their faith. They were scared. They were behind locked doors, but something changed them. And what was that? Faith in a resurrected Savior makes a difference. It changes everything. And so their lives were transformed because their faith gave them the ability to know that if Jesus could be faithful to do everything he said he would do, how much more when he said, because I've overcome, you can overcome. I will be with you always. And so it changed their lives. And I believe, my friends, it can change us as well. Why? Because once upon a time, there was a version of Christianity that was fearless. Despite threats, despite persecution, despite imprisonment, despite opposition, no matter where they go, going into a pagan and dark world, through opposition after opposition, they did not back down. They did not relent. They stayed faithful to God because they were fearless. Once upon a time, there was a version of Christianity that inspired heroic living. People who got involved in what others considered not worth it. People who cared enough to allow their time, their talents, their treasures to be used to impact and make a difference in the world. People who, who, because of Jesus, arose and allowed him to do things through their lives because they were willing to not pass by. They were willing to not put a blind eye or a deaf ear or a hard heart to the circumstances and crisis of their world. They were willing to not run from those situations but run to them to make a difference to make him known. There was once upon a time a version of Christianity that the people of the world stood in awe of. Others may not have understood why they did what they did. They may not have understood the practices that they engaged in, but they looked at a group of people so committed to what they believed that they were admired, they were in awe, and slowly but surely, People began to gather to them. People began to become a part of them by the hundreds, by the thousands. In fact, entire communities became transformed because people were drawn to a faith that was so powerful that it changed the lives of those that embraced it, that others were willing to follow them in those ends. You see, the first followers of Jesus They were just regular people like you and I. But something they believed changed their very lives. And here is the good news. And the heartbeat of what this series is about is that the same thing that changed them, the same faith that they received is the faith that has been handed down to you and I. And it is the same faith that can cause that version of Christianity to live in this generation as well. You see, the early followers of Jesus, if they were to think about the future and see the world as we see it today, if they could ever recognize the impact that Christianity would have upon the civilized world, that there would be in every, almost every wedding ceremony references to Christ, that every, every funeral 
gathered around with the hope that Christ had provided, that there would be gathering places of faith right out in plain sight, everywhere you go, and come to a nation like America, and almost on every corner, the freedom for people to gather, to worship, and to lift up his name, or to think this, that at the very capital city of the empire that sought to destroy them, to wipe them off the face of the earth, would be in some estimation, some would say, became the center of Christianity. Or to think that the symbol of death and horror and intimidation, the cross, would ever become the symbol of hope and new life and be worn proud as an article of faith just would blow their mind. You see, how did Christianity spread? Because there was a fearlessness among people. When Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and tell the good news of what I have done for every human being. Go into all nations and gather them and train them to be followers of me. That didn't come across to them as impossible. That didn't come across to them as intimidating because they believed he overcame. And because he said he would be with them, they believed all things were possible because God had proven himself. Everything that he had promised. See, Jesus had told the disciples what would happen before he ever entered into Jerusalem. Jesus was fearless and they watched him overcome death, hell, and the grave and now promised to be with them. So they believed that it was possible that despite opposition, despite persecution, despite every difficulty and hardship and challenge that would come their way, that they would turn those challenges as instead of something to stumble over, something to walk above, something to overcome, something to make his name great in all the world. That's what came. And one of the reasons, guys, behind all this is that I have found that today in the 21st century, modern day followers of Jesus are almost ignorant of what it took to give us the faith that we often take for granted. And you and I have a responsibility in this present generation because there are times coming that the Bible has spoken about, just as Jesus had told the disciples, because the opposition they faced, Jesus told them, These are the things that would happen to my followers. But they did not recoil in fear. They did not pull back from the challenges because he had said it. He had overcome the grave. What did they have to fear? No longer did they cower. No longer did they consider themselves less than. Because of Jesus, because of who he is and what he accomplished, they believed they could do exactly what he commissioned them to do. And so they went into the first, second, third centuries and proclaimed it simply by well the lives that they lived. In fact, if you're taking notes with me today, here's the heartbeat of it is this. Fearlessness is the heart of faith. Fearlessness is the heart of faith. Those followers, when they embraced Christ, because of now who believing he was and what he had accomplished for them, They believed the mission was possible. And this is amazing. You know, the the book or the ancient manuscript that was written about the early early, uh, deeds of the first church, I'm glad it wasn't called, notice it wasn't called, this is amazing, notice it wasn't called the thoughts of the apostles. It wasn't even called the philosophy of the apostles. No, what it was called was the acts of the apostles because real faith requires action. Real faith says, I, because he did, I can. Because he said it, it is possible. And so what happened? 40 days after the very death of their master, now risen from the dead, those disciples waited in Jerusalem like Jesus told them to the coming of the Holy Spirit, and immediately they were ushered out into the mainstream of life, out among the same people that just 40 days before had, had cried for Jesus' death. This always fascinated me, 
How could Jewish believers give up one of their own, another Jewish rabbi to the worst kind of death in the ancient world to call for his crucifixion? And now amongst these, Peter goes out boldly and declares, all of this was a part of God's plan. All of this God did. Here's the message. God sent him. You crucified him. God raised him from the dead. And now there is salvation to whosoever believe. So say you're sorry and believe. Embrace the Savior of the world because there is no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. And immediately the Bible says, they were cut to the heart and said, men and brethren, what must we do? In fact, they didn't stop right out in the main corridors, right into the temple. Right, they found a man just a few days after that was lame. For 40 years, he had been by the beautiful gate, the main entrance into this Solomon's temple, okay? And so coming in, they find him, and Peter looks at the man and says, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have Give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Arise and walk. And they grabbed them by the hand and immediately the man came into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And crowds began to gather and Peter took the opportunity to boldly declare again, do not think that there's anything special about us. Let me tell you, it's name and faith in the name that makes all the difference in the world. And so unashamedly, boldly, fearlessly he proclaimed exactly what he believed. And then they were arrested, he and John, by the same group of people that had had Jesus not only arrested and turned over to the dead, just some 45 days before this, the Sanhedrin take Peter and John into custody. They threaten them and tell them, do not speak any longer in this name. Look at what you've done. You fill this whole city with your doctrine. And Peter said, you can say what you want to say, but I will obey God and not man. And they stood amazed at the boldness of them as they were just ordinary, regular people who had been with Jesus. So they say to him again, now think about it. Would you consider it a vain threat if they had the ability to arrest Jesus and see to his crucifixion? They said, do not teach or preach any longer in this name. And so what did they do? They beat it out of town. They run and hid. And that's why we don't have, no. I want you to be Bible readers. The story is better than I'm telling you, okay? No, what did they do? They went to their own company and the Bible even records how they prayed. Listen to what they said. Almighty God who made the heavens and the earth. You see, fear is faith in the wrong thing. You see, when your faith is rooted in God, what is, poss what is impossible to Almighty God? When your trust rests in him, Fear dissipates and leaves. And so they said, sovereign God, all this has happened according to what you had already preordained. We missed it. We didn't even see. Isaiah had told us that he would be pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that would bring us peace with you would be upon him and with his stripes, we would be healed. He was the promised one. You did everything you had foretold. Now, Lord. Lord, behold their threats and give unto your servants that with all boldness we will declare your word and stretch out your hand to heal and do signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. See, their faith is what gave them the ability to courageously and boldly declare the name of Jesus. They didn't cower. They didn't run. When threatened, they didn't withdraw. And so what happens? Immediately, these same ones that had been told by the Sanhedrin, don't do it. Next day, out in the temple courts, just like Jesus, plain sight. We're not hiding. We're not cowering. We're here to do what he told us to do. If God said do it and you say don't, I'm siding with almighty God. And so what? They're preaching about Jesus. And so the Sanhedrin have him arrested again. They pull him into the prison. Now, They've got a difficulty. 
Acts 5 tells us about their debate. They were considering killing them. But then they recognized, man, we killed the head. I didn't stop it. Maybe we just got to cut off some more heads. But then a man, an esteemed one, a rabbi of great notoriety, a man named Gamaliel. He was actually Paul's mentor. He gets up and speaks, and he was kind of like the E.F. Hutton of the day, because when he talked, they all listened, okay? And so Gamaliel begins to discourse before these guys, and it's such amazing wisdom. He says, hey, listen, guys. We've had false messiahs that have come along the way. We've had people that have arisen, gathered some people around themselves, but when they were killed, their followers scattered. And he went through a couple of different incidents that they all were aware of. And he says this, why would we go about handling it this fashion? If this movement is of man, it will fail. It will never continue. It will dissipate. But if this is of God, do we really want to fight against God? And so what happens? Acts 5, turn, if you have your Bible, turn with me. Look at this. I love it. And what happens? It says his speech persuaded them. In other words, he was influential. What he said to them caused them. So what did they do? They called the apostles in and had them what? Flogged. Now, let me give you a little demarcation so you understand. This is not a scourging like Jesus got because when the Romans did it, they put bone fragments and lead in their whips, which would fillet people's skin off. Now, part of Jewish history, the Jews would give a lashing. It was a form of punishment that could be set down by the leaders. And so this was a Jewish flogging, which wasn't any more pleasant, okay? It just didn't fillet you and... And, and, you know, many, many people died under Roman scourging, okay? But in this, this was to give a point. This was to threaten and intimidate. This was to say, we are serious about what we mean. And so they called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them that they not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. They figured, man, we're going to put, we put some muscle behind this, okay? So how did the apostles respond? And the apostles left the Sanhedrin and cried and complained. They said, oh God, please get us out of here. Oh God, I didn't know it would be this tough. Oh God, I didn't sign up for this. Oh, wait a minute. That's the Pastor Ken version, no, I'm kidding. This, that's the 21st century version, no, I'm kidding. The, the apostles left the Sanhedrin, what? Rejoicing. Now, when was the last time you rejoiced that you got a whooping? Seriously. But they rejoiced because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Okay? And then look at verse 42. Day after day, how did they respond? What did they do about that threat? Day after day, in where? In the temple courts. Are you kidding me? The people that told them, don't do this anymore. The people that had the ability to flog them, they discounted that command because it defied what God had given them the responsibility to do. And so day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. These once cowards, these once fearful individuals that when Jesus was arrested, fled, and left him high and dry. These once ones that were cowering behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jewish leaders, something changed. Something transformed them. And what is it? It is the same faith that has been given to you and I. If it changed them, it can change us as well. You and I need to recognize the power that's behind all this is that when it is, when we're willing to stand for what we believe, because you know what? In our day and in our time, how, how did our faith come to us? How did Christianity even get out of the first century against immense persecution, against immense opposition, against immense difficulties and challenges? It was because the people that embraced it were fearless. The people that embraced it believed more in God than the threats of the enemy. The people who believed it 
believed that their faith was based on a resurrected Savior. Therefore, what do I need to fear? My future is secure. Why would I back down? Why would I give in? Why would I not pursue what I have been given the commission to be a part of? If Jesus said to me that in me you will have peace, In the world you will have trouble, but fear not. Do not lose heart. I have overcome the world. And if he's the same one that said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, then I don't care what comes my way. God is bigger than the challenges. I'm gonna be faithful to what I've been called to do. Now think about it. The impact it can have when people believe so much in what they believe in that they're committed to it under any circumstances. You know, I read something years ago about a young man who became a part of the Communist Party and wrote back to his girlfriend, I'm sorry, I gotta break it off because now, you know, my commitment to the party, I'm willing to go out even amongst the jeers of people that don't accept, I'm willing to sacrifice my income. And you think about things that have been portrayed in our world and stuff that's gone ahead that we, we struggle with. You think about today, in our day, Islamic extremists, people who are like, so believe in what they believe, they're willing to walk into a, a center full of people and blow themselves up. Now we're all like, you know, that, 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 that absolutely defies our Western mind to think that's really good. But here's the point. When you look at it, you say, man, there is a commitment to what they believe. A part of my journey of faith, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, nothing against the Roman Catholic Church, listen to me. But when I was in college and I heard the very first thing that got me open to the gospel of Christ. My best friend in high school, his mom was a Jehovah Witness. Now, I never knew what that meant. I had no earthly or clue of it, but his sister became one. And his family, we, we were like brothers. We were really tight. So when Lisa became one, we began to talk. And I realized when she would ask me about the Bible, I was clueless to what the Bible said. I'd gone through catechism. I'd been all, you know, I'd have my first Holy Communion. I had my baptism as a baby. I went through all my church rites, but I had no idea what I really believed and why. And it shook me. And then I said, oh my goodness, you gotta be kidding me, Lisa, you knock on doors? Whoa, fanatic. But you know what actually happened? I started to recognize, what do I really believe and why do I believe it? And here's the thing, guys. Do never be afraid when people question back why you believe what you believe. We need to have an answer because it's like this. Have you ever gone out on on a frozen pond? You wanted to skate? Well, first time anybody goes on it, what do they do? They kind of like, you know, kind of checking if the water is safe. If people were looking at you today, would they have the confidence to devote their whole lives to the faith you say you believe in? Is your life absolutely committed to what you say you believe? Because our belief isn't, isn't, doesn't, doesn't grow by violence. It doesn't grow by the sword. In fact, the leader of our faith said, go into all the world, love your enemies. Because the way that people will know you're my follower is by the love you demonstrate. You see, our faith has the ability, but do we believe? Because the man that was responsible probably more than all of the apostles for bringing the faith of Christ to the pagan world was Paul, once a skeptic, once one who tortured and killed believers of the faith encountered the living Christ, and his life was transformed. Paul, despite opposition, he was stoned, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked a night and a day in the sea because of his faith, never stopped, never once withdrew. In fact, as he came towards the latter part of his life, when he felt compelled to go to Jerusalem. When you look at, if you're, when, you, when you read your Bible, you might, maybe in the back there's maps that show Paul's missionary journeys. In his third missionary journey, He's coming around. He meets the leaders of one of the most powerful churches that he planted, the the leaders in Ephesus. And in Acts 20, it says this. Acts 21, or Acts 20, guys. Nope. Okay, 20, 22, it says, now, when compelled by the Spirit, he said, I am going to Jerusalem, 
not knowing what will happen to me there. See, Paul says to these guys, listen, I'm on my journey. I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know what will happen to me there, but look at verse 23. He says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Now, imagine if that was you, okay? You almost think that there's, is there a contradiction here? The Holy Spirit's compelling you to go, and then at the same time, he's telling you that hardships in prison are awaiting you. But you see, Paul has become just like Jesus. Because what did Jesus tell the disciples on the journey to Jerusalem? Guys, let me tell you what will happen before we even get there. The religious leaders will arrest me. They will put me on trial. They will turn me over to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will flog me, mock me, crucify me. But on the third day, I will rise again. Jesus in plain sight. That's where we began this series. Do we realize what our faith is based on? Because the leader of our faith demonstrated for us a fearless life. And he knew that that was what it would take to bring salvation to all mankind. And so Jesus considered you and I worth going through that for. And Paul says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So how do you respond, Paul? Verse 24, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul said, listen, guys, why would I live in fear and not fulfill the potential of God? That's what you have to ask yourself. Why would you live in fear and not do what God created and called you to do? Why would you allow others to talk you out of the faith that God has inspired in your heart because God wants to do something through your life, but are you committed to it? Just because somebody looks in a way distastefully at what you share, does that dissuade you? No, where is the backbone? Where is the courage? Where is the fearlessness of our faith? And so Paul, in Acts 21, he comes to Caesarea on his journey. And look what happens. And after he had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. In verse 11, in coming over to us, he took Paul's belt and tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says... In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Verse 12. But when we heard this, and we and the people, it says, and, and we and the people were pleaded with Paul, what? Not to go up to Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? Guys, this happens all the time. Because of hardship, People around you that love you, that feel the best interest for you, will try to talk you out of fulfilling God's will. Parents, why are you afraid to send your kid on a mission trip? Because you're afraid that they might not have a hot shower? Because you're afraid that they might not sleep in, a, in hotel accommodations with a four star on it? Why as adults are you afraid to get out, to get your hands dirty and serve on our outreach teams? Why are you afraid to get involved in the brokenness and fallenness in our world, thinking that it's somebody else's responsibility? Are we afraid? Are we living in fear? Are we cowering at the problems that are around our world because we're willing to talk somebody else that says, no, I want to do something with my life. I want to make a difference. Parents, if your child came to you and said, you know what, I want to serve in a foreign land. I want to teach in, 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 a land, in a nation. They said, well, what about the income? What about the house? What about the American dream? What does our faith mean to us today? See, Paul, how did he respond? Because when he heard this, they all talked to him, tried to talk him out of him. Paul answered, why are you weeping? and breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. In verse 14, and when, and when he would not be dissuaded. How many times, I remember when I got born again, okay? I was a college student. I was on my way, okay? As a young Catholic boy, I felt the call of ministry. And I always tell this, I say, you know what? I hit puberty and realized this wasn't gonna work, okay? 
Catholic priest's life was just not gonna fit with that end. So when I actually gave my heart to Christ as a 20 year old, okay, I felt the call of God again. And now the faith that my family was trying, my, some of my family had come to faith in Christ, now my decisions, that I was changing the trajectory of my education, I was going in the way of going towards ministry, then all of a sudden, what they thought, they wanted me to believe, they thought you believe too much. And how often do people around you, with their own intentions, try to talk you out of doing the will of God? And Paul said, he would not be dissuaded. And so they gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. You see, how does the gospel make impact upon society when someone is bold enough to live what they believe despite what everybody else, even with good intentions, tries to say. It means that I am going to follow Jesus no matter what. And then what happens to Paul? Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's arrested by the authorities. All that was said to him happens. And he finds himself in prison. And he writes back to one of the churches that had supported him so faithfully over the years, the Philippians. And look at what Paul wrote to the Philippians. In the letter that he wrote to them from prison, we call the book of Philippians, he writes this, now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. In other words, you may be crying and upset and go, oh my goodness, Paul's in jail, life's over. No, God knew exactly what God was doing. And Paul said, everything that has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. Do you know that if Paul had not landed in jail, what we hold in such esteem the New Testament, half of it would never have been written. It was during the time of his imprisonment that Paul could finally be quiet and still enough that God could work through him to write what's still in existence thousands of years since he penned them that has inspired millions upon millions over the generations. What? All that God was doing. It was advanced because God knows how to run his church. The question is, can you? You trust them. The question is, will your faith trust God despite what comes your way and know that God, here am I. See, the best way to live life with fulfillment, the best way to live life with meaning is to surrender yourself to the will of God. Do you think Paul is sitting up in heaven and missing out that he didn't have a mansion by the seaside in Caesarea, that he didn't have the finest chariot in town? No, Paul is the author of so much of what has inspired our faith. No, he lived the most rewarding, the most fulfilling life that anyone could ever live. Therefore, it's not measured by human standards. The question is, do we live for the will of God? Paul said all of this has advanced the gospel. Then what happened, verse, 12, verse 13, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of his imprisonment, Paul came before Festus the king. He came before, Fe he became before Felix. He became, he came before even Nero himself. Paul witnessed the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly, even to the leaders in Rome. And many began to come to the faith because of this, because his life, was not deterred because of what happened to him. And then he goes on to say this in verse 14. He said, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel. What? Without fear. When somebody lives without fear, it inspires. When somebody lives without fear, it gives courage to others who come behind them. If you have children, if you have grandchildren, what does your faith testify to the generations to follow? Is your faith willing to endure every situation without flinching, without backing down, without giving up, without turning over, without letting go? No, I believe no matter what comes my way. Others were inspired. No, I'm no nuclear physicist, but one of the greatest natural powers we've tapped into is nuclear power. 
okay? And how, does in, how do you split an atom? Now, again, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I do have read enough. I'll dumb it down and make it simple enough is this. When you have one atom that they bombard with a laser thing, that eventually the beginning and the changing of the atom will make it go through points where when it, when it splits, it releases a chain reaction. And hence, that's the power of a nuclear uh, 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 reaction. It's dynamic. Now imagine with me spiritually, when our faith reaches the point in which our lives are given to Christ unashamedly, unabashedly. God, here am I. Whatever you want to do, wherever you want to send me, whatever you want me to say, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to run in fear. You see, how did the Christian faith get out of the first century, second century, third century? How did it change a pagan world to become what we take for granted. You know, I have immersed myself over these last few weeks in so many of the historical documents, rereading again about what uh, a secular people even said. In fact, this one I found was fascinating. Claudius Gaius, who was a Roman medical doctor, you know, Romans had a lot of superstitions about dead bodies. And very few people were allowed around these ends, but he was also a writer. And so he was allowed to examine all of these bodies of Christians and watch the events because the Christians were put as a spectacle before the Roman Empire in coliseums and in festivals where they were killed for public sport. And what did he write? He said, for fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something that we witness in them every day. How did Christianity change the world? Here's the deal. In fact, one of the writers said it this way, Christianity in the, Re in the Greco Roman world. The Greco-Roman world was brutal. The Greco-Roman world, fear dominated it. It was, it was horrific in so many ways. And here's what they wrote. They said that Christians were the essence of life in the midst of the culture. In other words, the problems that began to plague the urban communities especially, things like homelessness and poverty, it was the Christian community that developed charity and hope. You see, to where the widows and orphans, the most weakest, the most vulnerable of people groups in all of the ancient times that were considered as nothing, there were no government support, there were no pagan opportunities, but it was the Christian community that began to create a new sense of family. Where do you think that orphanages have their roots? If you have never studied history, you don't know the impact because many people in the 21st century, we pride ourselves on what we, we are so confident and believing that human rights is something that the West develop without the understanding of where it came from. It was Christian thought. It was Christian lives. It was people of faith that believed that the least of these among them were ones that they needed to give their lives to. So, ro so widows and orphans, in fact, when there was the problems with aliens and strangers, when people would roam about the Roman Empire, they'd come from a different culture. Now, they were strangers in a new community and people ostracized them like people do when they're fearful of people they don't know about. But what it was, the Christian community created a sense of welcome and immediate attachment that they were welcome into this community. When there was strife among ethnic groups in the ancient world, it was the Christian message that brought the message of solidarity because we believed that all mankind were intrinsically valuable, that all of us were created by God, that all all of us had value and esteem. And so therefore, it was the Christian community that said by one blood, God had united all mankind. In fact, when there were epidemics and when there were hard, when there were catastrophes that would happen in ancient culture, here, this is history, friend. Not something I'm making up. For second century, third century, when the plagues hit, pagans, they would take their even beloved loved ones and leave them out in the streets because they thought this, if we allow a diseased person to remain in the house, everyone in the house will get the disease. And who was it that came and took their loved ones and brought them to their homes and to their communities? It was the Christian 
community. When there was fires, when there was earthquakes, when there was disasters, they shared their belongings. They cared for people that other people didn't care anything about. If you know why, we're Christian communities responsible for hospitals around the world. The roots of our faith go back because why? Jesus had said, when you do these things for the least of these, you do this for me. People that simply lived what they believed changed the world. And when you read even what historians say, that the reason that Christianity became the predominant worldview is because it provided a way of life that was so radically different and so much more uh, uh, embraceable and that Christian leaders did more to help human needs than all of their counterparts combined. Where have we come in our day? Where does our faith as believers lie? Do we believe that the problems of our world are somebody else's responsibility or do we believe in the same resurrected Savior that said to us, go into all the world? Do we believe in the mission that we've been given to make Jesus known both in word and in deed? Do our lives reflect a commitment to our faith that is fearless, that doesn't walk by and think that it's somebody else's responsibility? Does compassion move me? Does my heart break for what breaks the heart of God? You see, fearlessness, if you're taking notes, let me, let me land this plane, listen. Fearlessness is a willingness to what? Number one, obey no matter what the cost. You see, when your faith tells you to do something, do you look at, if it's beneficial, I'll do it. And if it's not beneficial, no, this is like the salad bar to faith. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Okay? No, 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 no. You see, if our love, Jesus said that love's deepest reality is obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Isn't it the depth of love in a marriage when two people are loyal to one another to the point that they say, forsaking all other, I cling only to you? When our faith clings to a risen Savior, that we're more committed to believe and trust what he says than our own senses, than our own feelings, than our own relatives, than our own friends, than everybody else that tells me why I don't need to. Instead of recognizing that my faith trusts God enough to obey him, no matter what it costs me. The Bible says of our own Savior, yet learn the obedience to the things which he suffered. Arm yourself with the same thought in mind rather to suffer in the flesh than fail to please God. When you feel God moving in your heart to go share a word of encouragement with somebody else, do you let fear talk you out of that? Instead of opening up and sharing your faith with somebody that you know is questioning, but you say, nah, I don't have enough education, I don't have enough support, I don't know about that, you talk yourself out of it, why? Because fear, does it dominate our dialogue and discourse? Does it dominate? Do we not get involved with our time, our talent, our treasures? Are we not willing to sacrifice? Are we not willing to get involved? Because we're not sure. You see, fearlessness is a willingness to obey, no matter what it costs. Number two, it's a willingness to remain faithful to the mission. Guys, why are we here? Why does the church exist? How will people know if we don't do what we have been given the responsibility to do? But here's the encouragement. If other generations could rise up during the challenges and inadequacies that they felt in their times, we can as well. The same faith that changed them is the same faith that changes us us to believe the great commission can be fulfilled in our generation. I'm just that crazy. I believe it. I believe that you people are the ones that God has predestined that in this time, in this generation, you can overcome. Why? Because he did. Because Christ is with us. That all the challenges of this present time are no different than the challenges in every generation before us. That we cannot take for granted what's been given to us. We cannot take the faith that we've been handed passively like it doesn't mean anything. But when we embrace the fact that our faith is based on a resurrected Savior, it changes your worldview. It dissipates your fears. It gives you the ability to know that because he's with me, I can do all 
things. God wants to fulfill his will in this generation. Here is my challenge. Are you willing? Faith comes by hearing. Are you hearing what God is saying to us as a church? Because there's got to be a willingness to remain on me, remain faithful to the mission. And lastly, listen, to live selflessly. See, early believers understood that when you do not fear, you do not fear losing. When you have nothing to lose, you can live selflessly. It made them willing to be generous. It made them willing to care. It made them willing to get involved. It made them willing to say, you know what? My time is not my own. My talents are not my own. My treasures are not my own. So question, friends, has your faith inspired you to make a difference in your world? Has your faith inspired you to get involved, to step out of your seat and get involved in serving the lives of others? Outreach ministry, missions, church. There are so many opportunities right here at Vertical Church. Much less the world that you live in. You walk by opportunities every day of your life. There is a world of hurting people all around us. When will our faith inspire compassion to move us beyond our comfort zone, past our fears, to get involved, to offer help, to offer hope, to get involved, to get our hands dirty, to make a difference in our world. You see, the faith that caused them to live selflessly is the same faith that will change this generation, that we will fulfill all that God has called us to do in this time. Why? Because they were tough as nails. Guess what, my friends? You can be tough as nails as well. He's the same Savior. He hasn't changed. God is ready for all the challenges we face. The question is, do you believe? Will you embrace a faith that doesn't back down, that doesn't stop, that won't be talked out of it, that will love when love costs me, that will care when caring is not what others want to do, that will get involved and help hurting people when you don't feel like it, when your schedules don't seem to allow it, that you change your life by your faith. Therefore, you can change your world.